Good day, everybody. My name is Dr. Sanjay Sanyal, and I shall be, I'm a surgeon by profession, and I shall be demonstrating a few ophthalmic instruments. The first instrument that you see here in front of you, this is known as a pair of artery forceps. Now, there are plenty of types of artery forceps, depending on their sizes, and whether the tip is straight or curved. This is a straight artery forceps. And because it is less than four inches or four inches long, it is also referred to as a mosquito or a Halstead's forceps. What are the components of an artery forcep? First, we have these two ring handles. The ring finger goes through the lower ring, the thumb goes through the upper ring. Then we have this catch, the ratchet catch. It's got three clicks of the catch, depending on how much pressure we want to apply. Then we have this joint here. This is a box type of joint. It's a unique joint insofar that one limb goes through the other limb. Therefore, less chances of slipping or breaking. And finally, we have the jaws. The jaws are different in an artery forcep compared to that of a needle holder. In a needle holder, the jaws are small and more stout because they have to hold the suturing needle. In this case, the needle, the jaws are a little long and more slender. And if you see the inside, you'll find a number of horizontal serrations. So what's the purpose of an artery forcep? The straight artery forcep is used to hold tissues and it's used to hold sutures, stay sutures. And these serrations are meant to get a firm grip. So this is a straight artery forcep. Before I conclude, we can also have a curved artery forcep. The curved artery forcep is used to hold small bleeding vessels and therefore it is also referred to as a hemostat forceps. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned for more videos. The instrument you see in my hand here, this is known as a Simco two-way irrigation aspiration cannula. Now if you take a look, this is actually a, a double cannula which has been merged into one. As the term implies, it is used to irrigate the anterior chamber with fluid as well as aspirate the anterior chamber from the excess fluid. If you take a look at this tip here, you will find that there is a small opening right at the tip. This is known as the anterior port. And there is another opening on the side here. This is known as the side port. Now, the anterior port is always meant for suction or aspiration from the anterior chamber and the side port is always meant for irrigating the anterior chamber. Now comes the question, which of these two hubs do we use for aspiration and which of these two hubs we use for irrigation? Now there is something called a direct Simco and a reverse Simco. Let's take the direct Simco first. This metallic hub that you see is a lower hub. In a direct Simco, this hub is meant for irrigation. So once we inject fluid through this hub, it comes out through the side port and it fills up the anterior chamber. And in the same direct Simco, this hub, which is attached to the PVC pipe here, is the aspiration hub. We aspirate through this and therefore the fluid goes through the tip and it comes out from here. So you have already guessed it. In the reverse Simco, the hubs are interchanged. In the reverse Simco, we aspirate through this hub and we irrigate through this hub, but the ports here always remain the same. The port, anterior port, is for suction or aspiration and the side port is always for irrigation. This is known as the Simco two-way irrigation aspiration cannula. Stay tuned for the next video. This is the next instrument that we use in ophthalmic surgery for any ophthalmic surgery when we need to separate the two eyelids. This is called a universal eye speculum. How does it work? You see this limb here and you see this limb here. This is the portion which is inserted under the respective eyelids. This portion goes under the upper eyelid and this portion goes under the lower eyelid. Once we have inserted these under the respective eyelids, then we use this screw handle. And once we turn it, 
we open up. That's why this is also referred to as the adjustable ice speculum. This is a universal ice speculum insofar that this can be used in either eye. We can use it on one eye like this or we can turn it and we can use it in the other eye. We can see there's a small angulation here. This angulation is the one which goes over the orbital margin. And the portion that we see here on my right hand, this is the adjustable section, the one which is used to adjust the width of separation of the speculum. So therefore, this is an adjustable eye speculum. However, this has got one drawback. If you notice, once we have separated the two eyelids here, this portion is unguarded. This means that the eyelashes can peep into the operating field once we are doing the surgery. Now, there's another interesting aspect to this eye speculum. Normally, whenever we have any screw handle, it is a universal rule that when you turn the screw in a clockwise direction, you close the instrument. But in this case, turning the screw in the clockwise direction opens up the eye speculum and turning the screw in the anti-clockwise direction closes the eye speculum. So this is the universal eye speculum which is used to separate the two eyelids during ophthalmic surgery. And before we close, I need to point out one more thing. What is the difference between the word speculum and retractor? The word speculum refers to separating two normal anatomical structures in surgery, like for example, the two eyelids, which are normal structures. A retractor, on the other hand, which is also used in various types of surgeries, are used to separate the tissues which have been dissected by the surgeon, the tissue planes created by the surgeon. So that is a retractor, for example, a cat's paw retractor. That is just by the way. So stay tuned for the next ophthalmic surgery instrument. This is the next ophthalmic surgery instrument, a very basic instrument, again, like the previous one. This is known as the Barraquet wire speculum. Again, the purpose is the same. It is to retract the upper and the lower eyelids while during any ophthalmic procedures. As we can see, this is made of simple, highly springy wire. That's why it is referred to as a wire speculum. And just like the previous speculum, this is also universal. It can be used in either eye. Always remember that this angulated portion is the one which is on the temporal side and this portion is the one which is inserted under the respective eyelids. So this limb goes under the upper eyelid, this limb goes under the lower eyelid. This is the 14 millimeter adult size. That means the separation between this end and this end is 14 millimeters, which approximately corresponds to the length of the eyelid. The unique feature about this is that the width of separation is constant. The width of separation cannot be adjusted. The distance between this end is 25 millimeters and the distance between these two is 22 millimeters. This is unlike the previous one where the adjust, whether we could adjust the width of separation, this is a constant width of separation. The next point to be noted here is that like the previous speculum, here also it is unguarded because there is nothing to prevent the eyelashes from peeping into the operating field. And just like the previous speculum, here also we notice that there is a small angulation which goes over the orbital margin. So this is the Barraquet wire speculum, the non-adjustable, unguarded, universal wire speculum used in various ophthalmic procedures. Stay tuned for the next ophthalmic surgery instruments. So this is the next instrument which is used in ophthalmic surgery. This is called the strabismus hook or the muscle hook or the squint hook. As the term implies, it is used to hook up the, one of the extraocular muscles during squint surgery. Now, if you were to take a look at this instrument more closely, we notice that I'm holding the stem of the instrument and this is the portion which is used to hook up the muscle. Now, there are two special noteworthy points about this end of the instrument. One, we can see that it has formed a double angulation. This double angulation is the actual hook which is responsible for hooking up the extraocular muscle. And the second point that we notice is the tip. The tip is flattened sideways. Now, this has been designed in such a way that it can be inserted under the insertion of the muscle where the muscle is inserted onto the globe and hook up the muscle. Though there is no comparison, but sometimes there may be theoretically a confusion between this instrument, this strabismus hook, and the lens expressor. The lens expressor is an instrument which is 
used to express out the cataractus lens during cataractus surgery. The difference is the lens expressor, the angulation is at right angles and the end is not flattened sideways but it is rounded. So this is a strabismus hook or a muscle hook or a squint hook which is used in strabismus surgery. Stay tuned for the next instrument in ophthalmic surgery. This is the next instrument that is used in ophthalmic surgery. This is referred to as the superior rectus holding force. Let's take a look at a few of the salient points about this instrument. First of all, let's take a look at the gripping surface. This is made of special springy stainless steel. The next point is, if you take a look at the surface which I am holding, it, goes, it has got corrugations and ridges on its surface so as to provide a grip without slipping from my fingers. Next, if you were to look between the two prongs, we see a small projection here. This projection determines, it governs the maximum pressure that we can apply between the prongs of the forcep. Now let's come to the end of the forcep, the most important part of the forcep. We notice that it has got a double curvature. The first curvature is designed in such a way that it goes under the upper eyelid, under the superior orbital margin. Therefore, this matches the orbital margin, this curve. Let's take a look at the second curve. The second curve has been designed to go over the globe of the eye. And finally, if you were to take a look at the end of the, the tip, we see that it has got teeth inside itself. The tooth forcep is responsible for gripping the superior rectus firmly. So this is the superior rectus holding forcep, which is used to stabilize the superior rectus and the eyeball. Stay tuned for the next instrument in ophthalmic surgery. The two instruments that I'm holding in my hand, these are the straight and the curved suturing forcep. The straight suturing forcep is held in the left hand during ophthalmic surgery and the curved suturing forcep is held in the right hand. The right suturing forcep is used to tie the knot. The left is used to hold one end of the suture material. Apart from the obvious difference, namely one is straight, the other is curved, let's talk of some similarities which both of them have together. I'll use the straight suture tying material to demonstrate the similarity. If you were to take a look at the tip, we notice that the tip is fine limbed. It is non-toothed. However, a closer look at the tip will demonstrate that on the inner surface of the tip, there's a shallow ridge and the portion distal to that has got a slightly flattened and a slightly rough surface. Therefore, when I apply pressure to the prongs of the forcep, the two flat surfaces come together and they gently grip the fine suture material without breaking or tearing them. The same characteristics apply to the curved suture tying material also. When I apply pressure, it holds the tip of the suture material. The left one holds the straight and the right hand holds the curved. It is used to tie the knot in sutures, in, su in eye surgery. Stay tuned for the next instrument that I'm holding in my hand. This is referred to as D. Becker's iris scissors. This is used for cutting the iris or iridectomy during surgical procedures, ophthalmic procedures, and it is also used for delicate intraocular procedures. Let's mention a few salient features about this instrument. Let's start with the end, which is between my fingers. First of all, we notice that the, these two limbs, they are highly springy. Therefore, this is also referred to as a spring open scissors. The next point that we notice are the tails of the two springs. One is inserted inside a slot of the other tail. This is to prevent the two tails from coming out. The third thing we notice is the gripping surface. Because this is a very delicate instrument, it has to be held very gently in the fingers to prevent it from slipping. The surface is ridged and corrugated. And the fourth point we notice is this governor here or the small projection which determines how much is the maximum pressure that we can apply between the two limbs of the spring. Now let's come to the most important part, the cutting end of the scissor. The first thing we immediately notice is that, that the cutting end is angled. Therefore, this is an angled scissor. But before that, the, where does this angulation take place? This angulation takes place at one swivel joint here. So unlike a previous instrument which I demonstrated, 
This is not a box type of joint, but it is a swivel joint. If we were to take a close look at the cutting end, we find that the cutting end is straight and angled. The two surfaces of the scissor, which are opposed to each other, they are flat, smooth and sharp. They are the one which is responsible for cutting the iris or any other delicate intraocular structure. And if we were to turn it, we find that the non-opposed surface, the non-cutting surface of each limb is blunt and rounded. So therefore, the cutting surface is smooth, the non-cutting surface is blunt and rounded. This is a D. Beckel's iridectomy scissor. Before I conclude, I need to tell you how does this differ from two other very similar instruments. One of them is known as the corneal spring scissor. The corneal spring scissor also looks very similar. It has also got similar features. Only thing is the cutting end is slightly scooped like this. It is used to cut the limbus during intraocular surgery. And the other is the vanna scissor. The vanna scissor has also got similar features. It can either be flat and angled or it can be scooped. Vanna scissor is even more small and more delicate. It is used for trabeculectomy, though it can also be used for iridectomy and other delicate intraocular procedures. This instrument which I am holding in my hand is D. Becker's iridectomy scissors. Stay tuned for the next ophthalmic surgery instrument, which I am holding in my hand right now. This instrument is referred to as the dust tool iris and pupil repositor. The middle portion of the instrument is the stem, which I'm holding between my fingers. However, the two ends have got different functions. Let's take a look at each end one by one. First, if I were to take a look at this end very closely, we notice that the end is flat, blunt and rounded. This is referred to as the iris repositor. And the purpose of this iris repositor is to move, position or reposition the iris, especially when it prolapses during any intraocular or anterior chamber procedure. Now let's take a look at the opposite end. The opposite end is referred to as the pupil repositor. The pupil repositor, the end is again flat. However, a close look at the tip shows that it is slightly forked like this, forked like this, forked. The purpose of this forked end is it forks against the pupillary margin and repositions the pupillary margin during anterior chamber or intraocular procedures. Therefore, this is the Dustur pupil and iris repositor. Stay tuned for the next instrument in ophthalmic surgery. The instrument that I'm holding in my hand, this is known as the Utrata Capsulorexis forcep. Apart from the usual features of the prongs of the forcep, which I have described in earlier videos, let's focus on the tip of the forcep. First thing we notice is that the tip is angled. This is the portion which enters the anterior chamber through the conduscleral incision. And if you take a very close look at the tip of the forcep, we notice that the tip has got a finely curved forward bent hook and it is very sharp. This is the portion which is used for the capsular axis and how is it performed? We use an instrument called the cystitome through which a small stab incision is made on the anterior capsule and thereafter this finely curved anterior hooked portion of this instrument is used to catch hold of the capsule, anterior capsule and a continuous step by step motion is used to make a curvilinear removal of the capsule. The process is known as capsular axis and because it is in a circular fashion in the central portion of the cataractus lens, it is referred to as a continuous curvilinear capsular axis. And this forcep is called the Utrata's capsular axis forcep. Please pay very close attention to the tip of the forcep. It's got a sharp forward hook of both the prongs of the forcep. Stay tuned for the next instrument in ophthalmic surgery. This instrument that you see in my hand, this is referred to as the Kelman-McPherson 
IOL for sale. First, what is the purpose of this instrument? The function of this instrument is basically to hold the intraocular lens at the haptic optic junction and to insert it into the capsular bag. A few quick points about this instrument. If you take a look at the, the prongs of the instrument, they've got very big guards. This is to ensure that we do not inadvertently apply too much pressure because if we do so, we might damage the lens. Now let's come to the features about the tip of this instrument. The tip of the instrument as usual is curved because it has to enter into the anterior, it has to insert the IOL into the anterior chamber inside the capsular bag. So we hold the intraocular lens at the optic haptic junction like this and then it is inserted through the limbal incision and once the leading haptic goes in and the lens goes in then we leave it there and then we use the next instrument which I'm going to demonstrate just now to position the lens inside the capsular bag. So this is the Kelman McPherson intraocular lens IOL forcep. Stay tuned for the, another instrument in ophthalmic surgery which is used in cataract surgery. The instrument that you see here in my hand, this is referred to as a FACO chopper and Sinsky hook IOL dialer. The middle portion of the instrument is the stem which I'm holding in the in my fingers and let's take a look at each of the ends. This end that we see here, this is the FACO chopper. It's got a very sharp curve and a very sharp cutting end. This is the inst instrument which is used to chop the nucleus of the cataractus lens when it is being stabilized with means of FACO probe. So this is the FACO chopper. This reduces the amount of FACO energy that is used to emulsify the lens. Now let's take a look at the opposite side. The opposite side of the lens has got a rounded curved small hook. This is the Sinsky hook IOL dialer. This is inserted after the intraocular lens has been inserted. This hook is fitted into either one of the holes in the IOL or at the haptic optic, uh, at the haptic optic junction and it is dialed around like a dial and it is positioned inside the capsular bag. That is why it is called an IOL dialer. So this is the FACO chopper and Sitsky hook IOL dialer.